huge on little kids. Uh, looking at metabolism. Metabolism is highest in the newborn and it decreases with their age. Now temperature and meta metabolism go together. Your temperature is a reflection of how much metabolism is happening and notice that's underlined and bold. Um, water requirements remain constant related to caloric expenditures so for every calorie you have a certain need of water with it. Babies don't necessarily need more water per calorie but they need way more calories per kilogram which also means they need more water per kilogram which is why infants have a liquid diet and slowly trans uh, slowly change over to solid foods then. Uh, caloric requirements, I'm told this comes up periodically on the state boards. Infants usually need about 108 K calories per kilogram and that drops down to teenagers only needing 40 and it varies in between there. It slowly comes down. And I said temperature reflects metabolism. Metabolism is what makes body temperature, right? So the higher the temperature, the higher the metabolism that's going on. Now neonates, one of the things they're very poor at is temperature regulation, thermoregulation. They can get hypothermic. When they get hypothermic, that can have a number of bad effects, including hypoglycemia, high bilirubin levels, and metabolic acidosis. Uh, infections can cause a high and more rapid increase in temperature in infants and young children. And any of you have, have kids know that, that children often will spike temperatures up to 103, 104, and that's just unheard of with adults, or an adult would have trouble tolerating it. Sleep and rest. Um, we all need sleep and rest. It, our cells need that for recovery and repair. Typically at a year old, most children are sleeping through the night and they take one or maybe two naps a day. Somewhere around 12 to 18 months, they'll drop down from having those two daytime naps to just taking one nap. And then around age three, they give up a daytime nap altogether. Infants need the most sleep and that declines uh, from about four to 10 years. And then it increases again during puberty. Here's some different pictures of different developmental stages. Kids this age are old enough to brush their own teeth and this is really bad cavities um, for toothbrushing that didn't happen. Preschoolers, they're starting to be social and play together but they're not very good at things like sharing and you get these aggressive acting out. And then school age called the age of the loose tooth. Kids a little older school age love to collect and in the hospital this will be the kids that you can ask them about their Pokemon collection or this kid looks like he's got a wrestler's collection. About that same age they also love clubs and they love rules. So these kids have created a club here. The developmental theorists we're going to look at um, well, we'll start with child temperament. There's three different styles. The easy child and you lucky parents who have those. They're compliant, they want to please you, and they're just easy. Difficult children. Those of you who have difficult children know who you are. You can describe them. They are defiant, they test the rules, they have to always ask why. They're just difficult. And then there's a slow to warm up child. They don't transition very well to new situations or new people. They just take time to get used to things and to people. And the three theorists we're going to look at, Freud, Erickson, and Piaget. Your uh, text does have a couple others, but these are the ones that we're going to look at. Now Freud, his theory is, he calls it psychosexual development, um, anything that had to do with senses, he uh, called psychosexual. Um, 
he says that all human behavior is energized by psychodynamic forces. We all have these three parts to us. The id, that's the unconscious mind. It wants immediate gratification, pleasure and immediate gratification. I'm hungry, so I'm going to grab your lunch and eat it. Then there's the ego, which is the conscious mind, and this looks at um, an acceptable way to do it. It looks, it's the reality principle. So I'm hungry and you have a lunch. Maybe I can talk you into sharing yours and tell you I'll share something of mine later. So I still get what I want, but I'm able to find an acceptable way to do it. And then there's the superego, which is the conscience or the moral arbitrator, the part of us that can decide if things are right or wrong. And perhaps I decide taking food from you when I know you have very limited um, resources and it's just not right. I have more food than you have, so I shouldn't take your food even though I'm hungry right now and want to eat. Okay, Erickson uh, has these psychosocial uh, developmental stages and you will get to know these. In fact, I would say mark this page in your textbook. You'll be coming back to it every time you're clinical. You'll need to look at where your child falls. Um, trust versus mistrust during that first year of life. Autonomy versus shame and doubt between one and three years. Initiative versus guilt three to six years. Industry versus inferiority six to 12 years. Identity versus role confusion 12 to 18. When you're doing your uh, patients, I want you to look at not just where they fall age-wise, but where do they fall functionally. You may have a 15-year-old who has Down syndrome, and he's functioning in that initiative versus guilt. He's five, six-year-old level. So when you're uh, doing your clinical paperwork, look at functionally where are they, not just age-wise, not chronologic. Okay. Piaget, uh, stages of cognitive development, and he talked about development of reasoning, that a child goes through these three stages, intuitive, followed by concrete operational, and then formal operational. Um, again, we'll look at every age in more depth, so I'm going to just leave it at that for now. He also talked about the development of logical thinking, that there's the sensory motor, which is birth to two years old, um, this is where kids have to experience it when they're little. They have to bite on it and chew on it, but it's still kind of trial and error learning. Then two to seven years old, pre-operational. And this is the main characteristic of this is egocentrism. They can only see things from their own perspective. They cannot see it from somebody else's perspective. You can't ask them to be put themselves in somebody else's place and understand they they can't uh, 7 to 11 years by this age they know how to classify sort order things and use that to solve problems but it's still very concrete then 11 to 15 years is formal operations and this is where they're able to finally think in abstract terms and this is characterized by adaptability and flexibility Kids also are developing a self-concept. They become aware of their body image and how they feel about their body and also self-esteem, just how they feel about themselves, how valuable they see themselves as. And that's an important thing. We want to encourage uh, positive body image and uh, high self-esteem in children. Now, developmental screening. We do developmental screening to quickly and reliably reliably identify at-risk children. We do that to be able to further investigate them. Screening is not the same as diagnostic tests. When I was a school nurse, I did vision on everybody. The kids who failed the vision test then were sent to the eye doctor to decide if they really had an impairment or not. Perhaps they were just sleepy that day or didn't understand the directions. So I, I was not diagnosing a vision problem. I was simply screening so those who might have a problem 
could go and be tested with better diagnostic testing. Now the most commonly used developmental screening tool is this Denver 2. And that's where all of, as we start talking about specific age groups and what developmental milestones they should meet during those ages, we're looking at the Denver 2 for what ages um, they should be able to do different skills. And that is this chapter.